Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to the program. It's a Saturday morning. Great to be with you. We're coming to you live from our Sunning Hill Studios in Johannesburg. This is ITV Networks. Great to be with you. And it is the end of the first school week of 2018. And as our little darlings are settling into reality, we do know that a whole host of issues are going to be cropping up. Number one on the list is bullying. And that's exactly what we're going to talk about on the show this morning with Stephanie Beauvais. She is a clinical psychologist and we're going to unpack bullying. So how can you mom and dad help your child through this very traumatic experience of bullying and how can you as mom and dad prevent your child from becoming or be a bully. We're also looking at poetry this morning and we're going to be looking at the buying and selling of a property. So very diverse but I should hope and I hope imagine that you're going to find it very interesting. Remember, as always, you can become a part of the conversation on our open lines. But let's get to the heart of the matter, and that is bullying. How do we help our children over this hurdle in their little lives? Stephanie, good morning. Welcome to the program. Good morning, Julie. Thanks so much. Thanks so much for having me back. Lovely to have you here. And the last time we were together, we talked about the five love languages. And of course, it obviously relates to each and every one of us. If we know the language we operate from and our spouses and our children, we can almost live happily ever after if there is such a thing. Mm. <laughs> but of course, it is back to school, back to reality. You are a psychologist, a clinical psychologist, yes. but you are the counseling psychologist at Saheti School. It's a I private am, school. Yes. And I know you're very happy there. Yes, I'm entering <laughs> my 10th year. So. Oh, wow, congrats. Thank you, thanks. Bullying is not anything that's new to you. Being in the school environment yeah. is something that it rears its head all of the time. Mm. Now, what makes a bully? And how old or young um, is the child when you as a parent or a teacher can see the traits of bullying coming through? Well, I think if I if I sort of lend from my um, borrow from my experience at the school, what I've identified is that bullying tends to kind of rear its head in the early foundation phases. So kind of from the age of six to eight, we start to see bullying becoming something of kind of confrontation in that early phase of um, formal scholastic um, experience. Being um, the psychologist who's worked in various parts of the school, what I've identified is that bullying tends to then peak in the intermediate phase of schooling. So basically in the phase that I'm currently working in, the grade fours to seven group, bullying tends to be uh, at its peak. And then it's, it tends to taper off. Do we know off. why? Do we know um, why? I think it's really to do with developmental processes. So if you're looking at a child who's going from um, a, a developmental process where they are starting to develop a sense of um, identity Entity. It can be extremely debilitating when uh, the value systems of your peers are, are different. And I think one of the things that promotes bullying the most is our inability to tolerate difference. Um, and so when we're in a, in a state of flux in terms of identity, and we're not quite sure kind of where we fit in, um, we tend to be somewhat confused in our role. And so I, I would imagine that that's why it peaks in that time. We also start to, at that age, become more aware of ourselves as a person. And when value systems clash, it becomes difficult for us to assert ourselves. One of the things that makes a, a, a an individual a target of bullying and I don't like to use the, the word victim so I tend to use the word target something that would make me a target of bullying is a, a, a difficulty utilizing social skills like assertiveness so when you're in that position of, of kind of flux of I want to stand up for myself and, and I have these ideas and I have these values and yet they clash with those of, of 
the population in my class, it becomes very difficult to access and operationalise those social skills. And that obviously becomes far more formalised in the high school years when we've had some time to practise. And we do then project far more confidence in the high school. We've then almost also obtained at that point often a level of affirmation of our skills. Um, there's also um, probably a lot more freedom and independence bestowed on a, a teenager um, or a, a sort of a burgeoning adult than there is an early adolescent at 12 and 13. You spoke about assertiveness. Yes. So, you know, here the trick is about the child being assertive. Um, and uh, obviously, if you're assertive enough, no one's going to mess with you, so mm. to speak. But there is a very fine line between assertion and aggression. Yes. How do we prevent our kids from crossing over into aggression? Yeah. So look, one of the, the major symptoms of um, the difficulties that our, our targets experience is that inability to manage the ambivalence between if I am assertive, well, in, that in and of itself can be construed as, as nastiness or meanness. They struggle to identify that bullying is very different from an isolated incident of meanness. So even if I'm firm and direct in my assertiveness and I know that that's going to create some kind of discomfort for the other person, I would rather interject that and I would rather sort of digest that than expose it to the other person. Targets are very often overly sensitive to how they impact on others. They often identify with the bully in terms of feeling like they deserve the treatment. So it's often very difficult to mobilize that as a skill that's of that's often construed as an important social skill, one that will serve them well when they're going into adulthood, into their work environment. Um, and so sometimes also what we find is the, the case of aggress aggressed becomes the aggressor. So often targets are of a sensitive nature. They do feel anxious and insecure. They are often our isolated population, the loners, um, if we could call it that. And so for them to feel as though assertiveness is something that is a positive social skill is very difficult to have them uh, conceptualise and understand. And very often they then swing, pendulum swing the other side. So they themselves can often become a bully because of their own experience. And really in that instance it's it's really a, a situation of survival of the fittest. Yeah. If I don't become a bully, I'm going to be bullied all my life, Yeah, sadly. And so I think it's important to teach our children the types of social skills that will, will help almost have them defend themselves non-defensively in a bullying situation. So something simple like an I statement. I feel upset because you are insulting me and I'd like you to stop can be extremely effective. Um, and so I think instead of sort of looking at schools becoming a no tolerance bully zone, we, we really do need to look at things like developing empathy. Because if we start with that, if we're able to be compassionate for how we impact on others, we almost don't really need to be addressing the bullying. It's m almost preventative. Sadly, in the school situation and the target group that we're talking about, um, and as you've been talking about people being different, are going to be targets of bullying. Um, also, if you've got an issue around weight problems, um, I should imagine there's also the gender issue. Mm -hmm. You're going to be a target depending on the ratio of the children in the class. Yeah. What other issues would impact? Colour, obviously language or if you spoke a little differently, if mm. you spoke with a mm. different accent, mm. um, the type of lunch you carry to school, yeah. the type of clothes, or, well of course we know we wear uniforms, but yeah. the way you the wear way your in clothing, which uniform is used, and yeah. the way you wear your hair, etc, etc. Yeah, look, I mean, I think anything that is diverse or different can often be for someone who is at the heart of it insecure, extremely threatening um, and provocative. So even if I express an idea that's marginally different to yours, um, if we're looking at a child who's developing on a narcissistic trajectory, that would be extremely anxiety provoking for that child. We don't see that manifesting as anxiety, we see that manifesting as aggression. So bullies um, like to demonstrate their power through 
aggression and oppression. So if I don't like your thinking, I might just dissuade others from including you, causing you to be socially isolated, deliberately excluding you, thereby being a definition of bullying. So That happens a lot with girls in, 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 in the school environment. Well, I think girls tend to be more socially excluding in the manner in which they bully. So you'll find that they are less likely to be physically Violence would be. Um, they they rely far more on their greater verbal acuity or their verbal capability than their physical strength. Whereas your boys tend to express that um, control and need for dominance in a physical way. So boys who bully tend to be physically stronger. Not always, but but classically that's sort of the picture that we we tend to find. You touched on something very important. In the classroom, as a uh, lesson is in progress, someone might, exp might express an idea which mm. is not um, possibly liked or favoured by the other mm. children in the class, and then that person could be, that child could be the target of, a yes. bully, of, of bullying. What can the teacher do in that situation to prevent that child becoming a target? Well, I think I'd like to respond to that in two ways. The first is that my experience is that bullying tends to happen not as frequently or as or infrequently, if we could say that, in the classroom environment. Bullying tends to be rife when there is almost a perception of a lack of supervision. So in your corridors, oh. between classes, um, in certain areas at break times where there's almost less of an observation or where you are less under evaluation. Because remember our bullies are also children who feel um, quite popular often with their peers and with their teachers. So they, they would struggle a little to express disfavor for another peer if they feel that that will come under um, scrutiny by a teacher. If that will interfere at all with their ability to have that special relationship with a the teacher, they're less likely to do it in, in observation of a teacher. However, that's not to say it doesn't happen. The second thing I wanted to say in response to that is that, especially at our school, we have such a wonderful way of linking curriculum to learning objectives in a more life-orientated way. So bullying is addressed across the board. I run an anti-bullying, and I also hate that term. <laughs> I call it the how to get on with getting along, because really it's about how do we actually learn to get along with each other. Um, it's not about how to not be a bully, it's how to learn to not just tolerate diversity because that in itself is discriminatory, but it's about celebrating being different. We are the rainbow nation after all. So it's really about saying how wonderful it is that we are all not the same. Um, and so the way in which we link um, almost life orientation, learning objectives like um, the acceptance of diversity is to use that experientially as a learning opportunity. So if I were the teacher, um, and I trust the, t the colleagues I work with to do this, um, it's really around, let's use this as a learning opportunity. So you've expressed something that maybe doesn't coincide with what someone else has expressed. Let's look at what's that, what's, what has that created in the dynamic in our classroom? Who's feeling uncomfortable right now? And why are we feeling uncomfortable? There is such an immediacy within the classroom environments, within Saheti, where I work, that it's, it's almost activating for a, p a person who is themselves a bully to be able to say, wow, I didn't realize I was being so oppressive. What's been so rewarding in the, the workshops that I've run alongside my teachers is that I've had some of the kids come forward to say, I think I'm being a bully and wow. I need help. Okay, let's so. go for an ad break. When we get back, let's talk about the teacher's pet. Let's talk about the classroom joker and also parents. When and how do they affirm their children to feel good about themselves so that they don't go out either being bullies or being bullied themselves. Stephanie Beauvais is a clinical psychologist. She's with the Saheti School on the East Rand right here in Johannesburg. We're talking bullying and if you have any issues around this you are welcome to call in on the open lines and still to come we're going to be looking at poetry and also the buying and selling of property.
Welcome back and waiting in the wings is uh, Iman Khan Suleiman to talk to us about poetry and then mother and daughter duo Nasima and Ashazia Khan who are going to be talking to us about uh, property buying and selling obviously they're going to tell us the tricks of the trade but right now it is the beginning of the new academic school year varsity whatever it is wherever it is that your children are at um, rounding themselves off as far as education is concerned and we do know that bullying is an issue that plays um, you know plagues us throughout life from kindergarten even into our working lives but we're talking about containing this in the classrooms and if you have any questions or comments do call in on the open line Stephanie we talked just before the ad break about teachers pet mm. um, are we opening this child out uh, opening this child up to be bullied in the playground because you know, obviously he or she is the favorite of teacher. What's mm -hmm. happening here? Why is this teach? Why is she or he teacher's pet? Mm -hmm. And what about the, 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 the classroom clown? What's going on in that child's head mm -hmm. that he or she acts up and, you know, is wanting to get a laugh a minute? Mm. Look, it's a complex dynamic because I think it's so easy um, as an adult, and although I'm not in the role of teacher or educator, I certainly teach in terms of the, the workshops that I offer. So it's easy to see how we can fall into the trap of allowing a child to feel as though they have that kind of special privileged relationship with you. Um, we're do you human agree after with that? All. Do you agree not with at teachers? all. And, and I, I do think our, our teachers um, are in the same position where although there's this con complete intellectual agreement with the fact that we um, demonstrate the qualities we'd like our children to embody and we are their, often their primary example of that aside from their parents, um, we want to embody the principles of equality and fairness and, and the acceptance of diversity. And, and when we fall prey to kind Kind of stumbling through that and allowing a child a special rela relationship. For example, if I send the same child on a message each time I need to get a message across to another colleague, um, it's demonstrating to the rest of the class that there is some kind of special relationship. Or at least, um, at the very least, a sense that I don't believe anyone else to be as capable of doing that, which itself promotes anxiety in children feeling incapable or feeling as though they don't have any special talents, which then makes them prone to bullying. And one of the ways in which we would help a target to feel more empowered is to help them focus on their talents and their strengths. Um, I think our school does exceptionally well at being able to manage um, not having a child left feeling entitled to any kind of uh, privileged relationship. Every child is, is made to feel special. Every child, all 25 of them, are made to feel as though they have a unique relationship with uh, the teacher, their teacher, um, but not any more special than another child's relationship. And so we've um, done well to eradicate the idea or the philosophy of, of teacher's pet. Um, I think teachers themselves have become aware or found themselves in situations where it's, it's um, almost injured their credibility and they've worked hard to recover that. Um, we've got incredibly insightful colleagues um, at Saheti where they're able to identify what's being pulled in them because we do have evocative children, we've got provocative children and remember we need to, to to realise that there is an in innocence around what they are projecting. Our children are in a testing phase. It's their right, it's their role. And it's our duty as the, the caregivers in their life to be able to help them understand what's appropriate um, and to model more appropriate behaviour for them. So when I choose different children to go on a message for me, they each feel as though they have the capability of being able to take on that responsibility and that independence. If I respond to your other question around the class clown, I often feel that those are the children that are possibly the most insecure. Um, their confidence is, is needing to be affirmed. And so they might play around, they might joke around in order to get the validation of both their peers and their teachers. For me, a child who is often um, falling prey to their own need to have um, a, a grandiose sense of humour or to be the laugh of the class often doesn't realise the risk that they are, are putting themselves in a position where, where they are often laughed at. And so for me that type of child has certain queries or concerns around their self-worth um, and those are the children who need our care and concern. 
That's not to say, though, that using humour or downplaying or minimising a rude insult or a joke from someone in the class um, doesn't help to combat bullying either. But there is a fine line, like everything in life, that needs to be done in moderation. So if I rely on my humour to survive being at the centre of an insult or being ridiculed, if I kind of say, um, I don't know, clown, or, clown around in the class when someone kind of puts me down, I understand confidently that that's actually not so. Um, but I have to be careful because if I play that role too much, I, I almost become stuck in that role. And you are more than just a, a, a humorous person. You're also intelligent and you're smart and you're bright. Um, and so it, it's, it's something definitely to observe carefully. Okay, and to wrap up, believe it or not, time's almost up. Let's talk about the parent's role in supporting the child from either becoming a bully or being bullied. What are the three or four most important messages that we need to convey to our children so that they're well balanced and they take that into the world, into the classroom and into the world with them? Well, I think as a parent, our, our primary function is to assist our children to be prepared for independent living. So one of the things I would want to teach my child is how to be empathic towards others. Not just how to be empathic towards others, but also how to observe the, the consequences of my actions, but also the impact that I have on others. And that then acts as my guide for how I should behave in certain situations. It also allows me to maintain appropriate boundaries. When I feel somebody is becoming invasive into my space, uh, making me or leaving me feel something I don't want to feel, I also then need to rely on the assertiveness as a social skill that is being developed by not just my parents, but also my teachers. Um, and so I think those are, are, are two extremely important processes developing empathy and compassion, also being able to rely appropriately on a, a normal level of guilt that we might feel. For me also, if I need to kind of know what I want in a good friend, I need to be a good friend first. Uh -huh. So I'm appealing to parents also to assist our children to become good friends. What does it mean for me to be a good friend? Things like, I need to stand by my word. I need to keep promises when I say I will. Um, a secret is a, is a gift. Um, and I also need to, to almost be able to take a step back and say, I, I don't wanna talk about this now. I think we're gonna have a fight if we do. Can we chill for a while, take a step back, maybe stay away from each other for the rest of the afternoon and tomorrow we'll reconvene. And those are skills for independent living, essentially. Parents also need to know the boundaries between when I go to school to complain about an incident. Uh -huh, that's very important. Versus have I operationalized all of the other steps before going into the school environment? We need to be very careful that we don't constantly um, put down maybe random acts of rivalry or healthy competition perhaps to bullying. Um, bullying has a very clear definition. If I as a parent am very clear that this is an ongoing repetitive incident of deliberate attempts to victimize my child, then as a parent you have a duty to come and advise the school as to what's happening. Schools themselves, and I'm appealing to schools at this point, need to have a very clear and useful bullying program in place. Bullying programs also speak to school codes of conduct. So if those two programs and policies are effectively um, assured, as a school contingent, I think you're, you're um, in a good position as a Just school. Just very quickly before we wrap up, what if I as a parent have exhausted all avenues that you've talked about and my child is continued to be bullied? What do I do without confronting the bully's parents because that might become horribly confrontational? Well, I'm not sure that that's ever useful. <laughs> um, but I think the first thing I would do is make sure that I utilize all my resources, one of which would be to, to have my child in a, a therapeutic environment. Um, if not with the school psychologist, with an independent psychologist in private practice, someone who can assist my child to develop those skills to stand up to the bully. And secondly, if then you've uh, exhausted those options, we need to realize that bullying is a serious issue and it does have legal complications to it as well. So if you feel that it's destroying your child's livelihood if they're not able to want to go back to school you do they need to consider legal um, advice as well so that would be your last resort the, the absolute last resort but uh, you know in my 10 years at Sahiti we've never really got to that point thank God we've always been able to, to sure. manage it with both the child mm -hmm. and the child who's also being a, a bully 
Okay, Steph, and that's where we leave it. Thank you so much Thank for your you so wise much for words. Me. Very crucial at this time of year. We're not suggesting that bullying only happens at the beginning of the school year, no. but let's arm ourselves, let's uh, empower our children so hopefully they can have a wonderful, bully free year. Yeah. Thanks, that was Stephanie Beauvais. She's a clinical psychologist. She's at Zahiti School and we've talked about bullying. Hope that we've given you a couple of pointers to think about. And if you do reach the end of your tether, if you've really exhausted all options, then of course um, the only other avenue open to you is the legal route. But we do hope and pray it doesn't get there. And you as a parent, you obviously play a huge part in the way your child behaves, how they deal with their conflicted or conflicting situations. And if you as mom and dad have furious fights and shouting matches at home, what are you going to expect to your child? How's your child going to resolve disputes? They're going to really emulate your behavior and sadly they then will become bullies. So mom and dad, please watch your behavior around your children. Don't fight and don't have screaming matches in their presence. Still to come, sublime. From bullying to something really sublime, and that is poetry. Thereafter, we're going to talk about buying and selling of properties. Stay with us. Lines are open. This is Let's Talk with me, Julie Ali. Bismillah and welcome to the program. I have a gorgeous little girl, well, not so little. She's almost a teenager. She's in studio with me. And this 12 year old is going to talk about the fire inside me. It's uh, a booklet on uh, poems by Iman uh, Suleiman. This is what it looks like. And if you call in and become a part of the conversation, she has kindly offered to give away about three of these books on the show this morning. So let's introduce you to this dynamic little lady. Let's find out what is it that makes her tick. And in this day and age of technology, it's so, so wonderful to know that there is the softness, this beauty, this art form that is still alive in our children. Iman Suleiman, salam alaikum. Welcome to the program. Alaikum salam. Thank you so much for having me. Lovely to have you here. And I'm so, so taken aback. I'm over the moon having someone like you in the studio with me. And I'm also really pleased to hear that we have young little ladies in our community into poetry. How did this start for you? Well, it started with my emotions mostly. So when I felt that I needed to express myself and let out my emotions, I decided to write them down in the form of poetry. How old were you when you decided to put pen to paper? I was 11 years old. Oh, from, from the age of 11. And prior to that, uh, what was it that kind of, do you think something happened earlier on in your life that just got you hooked into poetry, the beauty of poetry? Um, gee, something did happen. When I was 11, my dad passed away. Oh, I'm so sorry. Gee, so, um, then I decided to express my, express my emotions by writing them down in order to channel them so I can deal with them in a better way. Did it help you? It really did. After I wrote my poems, and I felt much more relieved than I did previously. Like I got out some emotions that were affecting me. A lot. And while you were writing, now I'm thinking about perhaps a sad poem. I mean, you've just said that um, once your dad passed away, you just had this um, whole bottle of all these emotions inside of you and you didn't know what to do with it. And you just decided the best thing to do is to write. As you were writing the poetry, what were you feeling? Were there times when you were really sad and really weepy and did you just cry and just just get rid of the emotions that way i don't think i ever did cry but while i was writing it i felt very pleasant and happy and proud that i was able to express my emotions in a way that wasn't affecting myself or anyone around me and i presume mom is behind you all the way she definitely is and i have to say thank you to her for actually helping me make this book a reality and helping me cope throughout life with all of my emotions. I couldn't have done it without her. Oh, wow. What would we do without mommies? I don't know. <laughs> okay, so you started writing and obviously mom 
saw that you're writing all of this poetry? Was she the first person to read your poems and decide uh, perhaps we should put it into a booklet form? She was, she read it and she thought that it was actually quite good and at first she wasn't exactly going to publish it. She was just going to make a book for me in order, like as a gift for me to keep forever and then she decided that it needs to be published. Okay. Did you have help from anyone else beside mom, help and support? What are your school teachers and, you know, your best friend? I'm sure you have a best friend. All yes, girls have best friends. What did they say when they heard and, and, and saw you writing poetry? I know my family members were very supportive as they understood what I was going through. So they were there with me all the time. And also my teachers were very supportive. When they read my poetry, they agreed that it was quite good and they understood that it could be published and they were very supportive. Mm. So how many poems are in this booklet? I wrote 25 of them and right. my father used to write poetry too so there are five oh, of his. Okay, so you get this gift from your dad. I think so. Wonderful. So you've got 25 poems in this little booklet. We're going to ask you which is your favorite one why is it your favorite? And then we're going to ask you to share it with us to read it. And then we'll talk some more. So which is your favorite of the 25 in this little booklet? And just before you start, let me show this booklet up to the camera to our viewers this morning. This has been written by 12-year-old Iman Suleiman. Um, she decided to start putting pen to paper to give vent to her emotions after her dad passed away when she was 11 years old. And this, I think, is a beautiful tribute and a legacy to her dad and just how he touched their lives. Alhamdulillah for that. So she She's written 25 poems. We're going to talk about perhaps a second book in the making. And she's going to tell us about her favorite poem. And she's going to read this one and possibly one or two more on air this morning. But if you'd like to get a copy of this booklet, please call in. Let's have your thoughts. Uh, maybe you want to say something to Iman. Say hello to her. Welcome her to the studio. Whatever is on your mind, please call in. Keep us company. And then you can obviously walk away with one of these booklets. So tell us about your favorite poem. My favorite poem is Who I Am and I think that I wrote this one with the most feeling out of all of them because I want people to understand me for who I am and love me for who I am on the inside and not for anything else. So, okay, and it's called what? What's your favorite poem, poem called? Who I Am. Who I Am, right. Your second best. I mean there's 25 <laughs> in here. When did you write Who I Am? Um, I'm not so sure, but I think coming toward the end of last year. Okay. It's just all these feelings inside of you mm. and you need it to, to kind of express it. Um, what else can you tell us about the other poems in the book? I think what we'll do is you're going to read a couple of poems for us, but after the ad break. So let's talk some more. What about the other poems in the book? Have you uh, dedicated poems to anyone special in your life? I don't think I actually dedicated any, but some of them are really special to me, like the one I wrote about happiness, because I feel that it applies to everybody around me and that they need to see the happier side of life. Mm -hmm. And you were able to write a poem on happiness despite the fact that you were really very sad when you lost your dad. I did have my very sad moments where I wrote poems about my sadness, but then sometimes my spirits were lifted and I felt that I could, ex I could express myself in a happier form and by admiring the world around me. Wonderful. And, and, and counting your blessings. Allah so khafur rahim. We have so much to be grateful and thankful for. So you're so right when you talk about happiness. And for a young little girl like yourself to be talking and having an insight into all of our emotions, I think is absolutely amazing. What are you planning for your future? What do you want to become when you're done with high school? Um, I am planning to study and do medicine. I would love to become a pediatrician. Wow. And I was doing poetry not as a career, but more for the people around me and wanting to make a difference in the world. But I would also love it as a thing to do on the side in my free time. Mashallah. Okay, let's take our first ad break. When we come back, we're going to talk some more about Iman Suleiman and, of course, your book of poetry. And you're going to share some of your poems with us 
on air this morning. The amazing Iman Suleiman, only 12 years old, but she has written this little booklet. It contains 25 poems. And if you call in with a question or a comment, you walk away with one of these compliments of Iman Suleiman and family, inshallah, to keep us company. First, let's go for an ad break. We'll be back with you shortly, inshallah. Welcome back. I'm talking to a very dynamic little lady. She's only 12 years old. She's written this amazing little book on poetry, 25 poems in all. And we are giving away about three of these books on air this morning. So to our first caller, Salaamu Alaikum and welcome to the show. Uh, Assalamu Alaikum. Wa Alaikum Salaam, dear sister, what's on your mind? I really admire what our parents and mom did with the situation. Because, yes, it was a wonderful idea to turn this little sadness into a, a blossoming flower. Mashallah, so absolutely. I'm really proud of that. And I hope all moms will take note of what happened and use this as a, a, a board, you know, a springboard to encourage our youngsters. They have so much talent. Inshallah, I mean, absolutely. She's an amazing example to the rest of the community and other young people like herself. Thank you, sister, for your words of encouragement. And we do hope you're going to enjoy reading the poems by little Iman Suleiman. Assalamu alaikum to you. Okay, to our listeners, we still have two or three more books of these. They uh, books on poetry. They are on giveaway. If you call in, you definitely will walk away with one of these. So back to the lovely Iman Suleiman. Uh, you've been telling me off air that, um, inshallah, well, I asked you what you'd like to do in real life, and inshallah, you've got your sights set on becoming a pediatrician. But does that mean that the writing or the poetry is going to stop? No, it is not going to stop. I actually really enjoy doing it. And I'm in the process of writing a novel. Oh, wow. Um, have you started already? Yes, I have. I think I'm about halfway through. And what's the novel about? Um, it's about this little girl. Her name is Jenna. And she discovers this secret world. And she has to kind of help the people there to stop a dark force from taking over because that new world is a means of existing for us, for her world. Okay, let's not give away too much because inshallah when the book is ready, you definitely have to come back onto the show to talk to us about it and we can then of course promote the book as well. When do you think that that book will be uh, completed? I'm not too sure but not too soon because I still need to write it and get it published. So hopefully at the end of this year. Inshallah, Amin. Any other poetry, any other poems that you're thinking of writing and putting it into, into book form? I have written a few already and I am hoping to make a second edition to my book. Mashallah, that's wonderful. Um, how difficult is it to write? I mean, you hear we're talking about your book of poetry, but I'm now thinking the storybook that you're writing. How difficult is it for you to write or does it kind of come naturally? Where do you get your inspiration from? Sometimes I do find it difficult to write because my head can be blocked sometimes. So I try my hardest to think of basically what to write and sometimes it doesn't come naturally at all so I have to stop and try it another day. And sometimes I just try my hardest to write the best that I can and it comes naturally sometimes too. So who's your sounding board? Because often when we think about a great idea or we're wanting to do something, we always want to pass it by someone. Is mom your sounding board? She is. I give her all of my chapters to read and then she tells me what I should fix and what I should change or whether it's good enough or not. So mom's your support system, an amazing support system, an amazing inspiration. May she always be at your side, inshallah. Now we spoke about your poetry, we spoke about your favorite one. Are you going to read it out to us now? Let's go, bismillah. Who I am. I don't want to be misjudged nor criticized. I don't want to be amongst those who are hated and despised. But sometimes, who cares about them? Write that down with ink. I'm a lovable person. That's what I think. I want to do what my heart truly desires. The thing I love most and what sets my soul on fire. 
I want to live life and be who I am. I don't want to be trapped in their jar of jam. If people don't love me for who I am on the inside, whatever, I am my own kind of wild. I feel that I should choose my own path, what is right from the heart. Mashallah, I think that is so appropriate. Um, in light of today's show, and it talks directly to my first interview. I was talking about bullying, and I think this truly addresses that. It's about people as individuals who need to be who they are and to be respected for who and what they are. So it ties in beautifully with my first interview, mashallah. Thank you for sharing that, and we do hope people take it to heart. Mm -hmm. Let's take our next caller. Salaamu Alaikum to you. Welcome to the show, and what's on your mind? Uh, I would like to congratulate this young lady, mashallah, she's done very well. And may Allah grant her success from friend to friend uh, and let this be an inspiration to her. Inshallah. I mean, thank you for your words of encouragement and kindness. And we do hope that you're going to enjoy the book on poetry by the lovely Iman Suleiman. Thanks once again for your input. Iman, <laughs> Iman, back to you and your second best poem in the book. Which is, which is it and why? Um, I think Sunset. I like it because it has a meaning and it kind of emphasizes on the beauty of this world and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it so glorious for all of us to enjoy. And that we should enjoy the little things in life like the sunset. Mashallah, do you want to read that for us, please? Okay. Sunset. The flaming orange glow of the sun's rays on the horizon, almost as if freeing the world from sin, setting in the west, the world in sight, towering above us, shining upon those below with all its might, the beholder of the eye to civilization, with its sparkle, it dazzles the human nation. It bathes my body in its warm rays, lifting my spirits in so many ways. It ignites my soul as it brightens the darkness, astonishes me, it is ever so wondrous. The world is out there, what a beautiful creation. Once again, there for the entire human nation. Mashallah, that's absolutely beautiful. Do you keep going back to the poems you've written to get further inspiration? Or once done, you kind of move on and start thinking about other ideas? I do look back and try and think of my poems in a deeper meaning. And I like writing on similar topics such as nature and feelings. So I do like writing on similar topics as my other poems. You also said that there is going to be possibly a second edition as far as your poems are concerned. What can we expect going forward, inshallah? It is not too much about my emotions and myself. It's more about what other people can experience and what's hidden within your soul. So you look deeper into a person and you find out what they're really about. Mm -hmm. And you can understand them better. Mashallah. In closing then, what can you tell us about, uh, you've talked about your book, you've talked about a second edition. What's the message you want to leave other young people with? We know that here in South Africa and possibly around the Muslim world, we have lots of uh, upcoming nasheed artists. So this has been a breath of fresh air coming across a young girl like yourself going into poetry. And I should imagine people, nasheed artists could even take your poems and mm -hmm. turn them into song. Would you like that? I really would. I would enjoy that. Oh, that's wonderful. So have you approached anyone to do that? No, I haven't. I don't think I know any Nasheed artists. Okay. Maybe I need to put you in contact with someone. But that would be wonderful and be a great tribute to you and your poetry and your poems, inshallah. In closing, your message to young people out there. Um, I think that you shouldn't be afraid to express who you are in absolutely any way possible. For example, if your talent is drawing, go ahead and be free to draw whatever you please. Don't try and fit in with the world around you because you were born to stand out. 
Mashallah. Thank you indeed for being with us. Lots of success for the future. A big hug to your mom for the amazing work she's done in raising such a fine young lady and for all the support she's giving you and of course to the rest of your family. And we look forward to your book. We look forward to your second edition. We're definitely going to follow you, inshallah, and have you back on air sometime soon. So go well and thank you for being with us on the show this morning. Thank you so much for having me. My pleasure. Assalamu alaikum to you. Wa alaikum salam. The lovely Iman Suleiman. We still have one book on, go, on giveaway. So if you call in at any time during the show today, you can walk away with the book. Thank you for watching this part of the show. Still to come, we're going to talk real estate, buying and selling of property. So let's get going. Nasima and Ashazia Khan, the mother and daughter duo, are in studio talking to us about the high-end property market in the Santon CBD. They manage and obviously also sell corporate property to people who are interested and obviously who can afford it. So let's look at the issues around the challenges in possibly, you know, uh, investing in a second property in this type of market. Nasima, how dynamic is that? You know, what would be the challenges? Let's assume I own a property that I live in somewhere in suburbia and I now decide you're making the sound so attractive and making me feel perhaps this is where I should be investing a bit of surplus cash that I have. What would you say would be the barrier to entry perhaps or the challenges or what should I know about entering or venturing into this market? Okay, first and foremost, you need to have a budget that suits you. We will then work out what your return on the investment is. We will then ensure that we maintain, maintain that you have a tenant in your unit each year. Uh, the, the apartments come furnished, so we put all the costs together for you and we'll tell you what your rate of return is. Now, when we get our corporate clients come in to rent these apartments, they're on a three-year basis, lease. Yeah, on a three-year lease. So you're getting your return on your income immediately, straight away. You know, we, we, that, that apartment's not going to stand empty where you're losing rental income. At all. At all. Mm -hmm. I mean, we ensure that, especially to our our buyers. We've got a whole lot of properties. We've got like 800 on our books currently. And uh, we've got, uh, we've met owners in the interim, we've built relations and they bring their properties to us. We're very well known in the Santon area. Um, we can't obviously fill in all these properties over a period of time, especially if the market goes down. Like we didn't have a very good year last year, but it's picked up already now in January. Uh, we, ex depending on the, uh, the political situation, depending on the market-related situation, there and then as we speak, uh, it's it's our job to ensure that we look after your investment, and that is what this is all about today. Is that once a client buys a property from us, we build a relationship with him, and we guarantee him that we will ensure that we put a client in your unit because we have dominated the area for a while, we have major companies on our books, we provide a service, we're in the area, uh, the owner all he has to do is sit back and wait for his rental each month. That sounds wonderful and obviously you char obviously charge a, a minimal um, management service fee. fee yes. Mm -hmm. What do you, Shazia, I know you come from, you study psychology, you haven't gone on to practice as a psychologist, mm -hmm. but just in dealing with your clients on a regular basis, I think your principles of psychology comes into play, yes, don't it they? It does. It helps me actually service the client. Uh, it helps me understand what they actually want and how I can actually go ahead and um, help them find what they're looking for. Um, yeah, and suiting the, uh, what suits their needs and also suggesting things that they, that they haven't thought of, but I can actually suggest things to them to, that will actually assist them in, in uh, going the better route or going the route that will actually benefit them more. Um, people often worry and wonder about fly-by-night operators yes. and you've assured me off air that it's not easy breaking into or making a career in the property market because you have to have specific qualifications. Yeah. What would those be? Okay, so basically uh, WITS now offers a new, um, uh, basically a three-year property course um, or universities offer that. And, um, base, and um, 
if you actually want to join a property company, what you can do is that you can actually uh, you can apply as an intern uh, for a company, and thereafter um, you take one year to actually do. Uh, there's there's also a, the board. There's a board that you have to report to as well. So um, you have to apply. Um, for as an intern and then you do a logbook um, for that year first year thereafter you study a level four a level four qualification you write a board exam on that and thereafter you study a level five qualification if you'd like to be a, a principal or an owner of your own company uh, and then you write a big a board exam on that part. now Nasima, i see you have obviously formed your own <coughs> company mm -hmm. um, obviously in direct competition with your international known brands yes. we're not even going to mention those names but we all know them, we yeah. see their boards yes. all around a town. How difficult was that? Did you meet any resistance when you tried to break into the property market? Uh, yes, I did uh, at the beginning. Um, it was trying and keep trying. That was my motto at that time. And uh, it didn't, we didn't let it really affect us. It did take us time and um, we found opportunity in giving a service at that time and being on the premises and uh, living in the area at a one build, at one building at that time for eight years was where people would find us, they'd know we are there, and if a client wanted to buy, he would buy. And um, it's all about the property at the end of the day as well. You know, mm -hmm. what stock that we've got, what's the right price, what is the rate and return, what rental income we can give owners, you know, if they want to buy in the area. And it didn't really affect us breaking into but this market. But it's a lot of hard work, lots of years and years of hard work, building up a reputation and a known product like a Nasima Khan properties, for example, as opposed to other international, internationally known brands. How do you still stay so competitive? I think we've grown with confidence over time. We do a lot of advertising in the area. Um, the honesty and integrity comes in as a big part. Owners know that we're in the area and on the premises and they can meet with us to, to view their properties or if they want to buy new ones, they'll always contact us because they got a service from us over a period of time. So it's all about the service that goes with it as well. It doesn't end when a client buys a property from us. We rent it, we manage it, uh, we call you back when there's uh, new investment properties coming up in the area, new developments coming up. <clears throat> so there's a lot that goes with us being uh, you know, making a name and how we got up there in the area. Uh, it's you have actually, to have your finger on the pulse yes, all the time. Yes, and we've got to be consistent. We've got to uh, ensure that, uh, you know, we, our marketing is, uh, you know, up there all the time. We're on different websites. We've got our own website as well. Uh, we've got a team of, you know, productive people in our how company. How big is your team? Okay, we've got eight people at the moment. Um, and we've got four agents that are out of our office, it's, you know, and we are the agents ourselves. Mm -hmm. We are hands-on, Shazia is very involved in the sales, um, I'm into the rentals and the corporate uh, marketing, I meet with all these big companies, uh, Shazia's husband's also in the business with us, and the, the wonderful thing right now is after he joined us five years ago, um, he pursued a career in commercial property, has just qualified and now we are renting office space in Santon. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay, you've also talked about uh, the opportunity for two interns to join you for a year. Why has that opportunity come up? And let's talk about this amazing, uh, it, you know, a whole year of growth. And would that person then eventually have, you know, be able to go on and in a couple of years time, open up their own rental or management agency? Yes, uh, we're giving the opportunity to anybody from the public because we know what this business is all about and we do need people as well and we're just giving back to the community as well. Uh, we find that nobody gives opportunities out there because we find it very difficult ourselves to get in there in the first place. And uh, we, this market, there's money to be made, you know. You've got to be at it. You've got to be a self-motivating person. Um, we're giving an opportunity to, to two people out there to have a career. That's a what would be the criteria for the person to qualify to join you as an intern? Would you like to respond to that? Um, yes. For, well, firstly, they need to want to do it. They need to want to sell property. They need to have a passion for properties, firstly. They also need to have a passion for sales. Um, 
you know, they need to want to sell, sell to people as well as they need to want to help people. They need to want to help people to, um, to find their properties, to find, to match. I mean, it can be quite uh, difficult. I mean, it's very easy to just speak to somebody and then not, uh, not assist them, but they need to want to, to assist them. That's where our company comes in and that's where we actually give a better service because, um, because we go the extra mile to assist people. So the person needs to, um, to also uh, uh, see a vision, vision for this. They also need to be quite uh, self-disciplined as well, um, because you know, being in a state it's agent, not an eight to five yes, job. It's not an eight to five job, and that's also a good thing for us sometimes. But um, uh, yeah, so that's what they need to be basically. They need to have a cell phone, and they have to need to come from an area where um, transport is easy to get to us. The important thing is we are there to train them. Mm -hmm. to give them the hands-on training. So after this one year of internship that mm -hmm. they serve with you, mm -hmm. what would their future prospects look like? Let's assume you found this ideal person who's willing to work very hard. They serve a year of internship with you. Mm -hmm. What next for them? Okay, so basically next what they will do is that they will uh, then go on to apply to do a, a level four qualification. Ah, okay. And uh, we assist them with that as well. And then uh, we assist them with uh, getting uh, writing the, the exams. Uh, you have to study for that as well. Um, so basically that's what you have to be to be with an actual agent. With the possibility hopefully to join you in the future. Yes, definitely. Or yes. <laughs> well, even open an own, their own branch in the area that they're in. Mm. Um, because we will guide them and assist as we are growing. We already have one branch in, uh, in Sunny Hill and we're moving to other areas as well. Therefore, we, whoever comes in to join us, we are willing to put out the branch there, educate them, you know, and get our Anasima company running and other Nasima Khan properties Almost running like in the a area. Franchise. Yes. Yes. Okay, perfect. Are you planning on perhaps going international? Uh, yeah, yeah. That's our vision. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we plan to go there, but we've got so much to do in the Santon area right now. Uh, you know, yeah, in time. For people watching us this morning, and I think I have touched on it a little earlier on, we have um, talked a little bit about it, but just give us more information. Let's talk about a second or a third investment property. What would you say are the key things for a person to remember as far as that is concerned? We know that without no. a doubt, they need to approach someone like yourselves who come, you know, have, you, you have a good standing in the community, you've got a good reputation, and you're going to do your utmost to service the, um, the client to the best of your ability. But what should be uppermost in my mind if I'm thinking of a second or a third rental, um, you know, investment in the C Santon CBD? It's an excellent uh, It's an excellent investment. Sorry, what was that? No, no. I said it's an excellent investment uh, as a second or third uh, property. Um, as we mentioned before, I think earlier, that um, you don't even have to stress about it. <laughs> we are right there. We actually look after the property. We manage it. We've got staff. We've got maintenance. We've got a team on hand that if anything happens, um, uh, we can actually sort it out. We deal with the tenant inside the property. Um, so basically, your investment is very safe with us. What sort um, of return on investment are we looking at here in okay. this property market? Okay, in this year, we're looking between 6 and 7%. Uh, we can even go up to 8% on certain properties, depending where they are. The old, um, if we're looking at a very fancy building like the Michelangelo Towers, we're looking at about 4% return there. But if we're looking at normal, uh, regular. high rise, regular, where it's completely occupied fully, we're looking at an 8% return. Um, and that is good for South Africa Decent at the enough. time because of where we are. If yes. you look at other countries, they're getting 4%. Mm -hmm. We've done all of our homework with where these buyers come in and say, you know what, it's so easy to buy in South Africa. Because remember, we're dealing with more of the foreign market. Mm. We're not only dealing with our local people. And they should get involved. They should consider coming into buying in the mm. area. I mean, there's, there's money being made and it's all going out of the country. Mm -hmm. this, is a, this is where we should also consider that, you know what, there are opportunities here for us. It is not finding out. They're thinking about all these very high expensive properties. But you know what, some of those properties are just overly priced. Now, where we come in is we do a market related value at that point in the on those properties that we are marketing. So we got a very fair press. 
being in the area for such a long time, we know what the rental market is all about. And we will ensure that you know you get your right return on your investment. Let's look at the downside. We've talked about, we've, we've painted a beautiful picture <laughs> of this market. Yes. Um, it sounds very tempting. It sounds truly lucrative. People watching us this morning have a bit of surplus cash. Um, you know, here's an idea. This is perhaps the route you want to go. But there obviously, with every good thing, there's the negative side mm -hmm. to it as well. What can go wrong? And what sort of lessons have you learned from all of your bad experiences? Okay. The only thing that could go wrong is if we have a, a, a client, in the, a tenant in, in the unit, and the contract ends in the middle of nowhere. Somebody decided, the company decides that they want to move their employees to maybe Dubai to work from because the political situation in South Africa is not safe for them. Then we've got this 10 properties that we rented to one company and all of them need to go. And here we're in six months into the lease or eight months into the lease. The worst that can happen is because we immediately would then remarket that same property to ensure that we've got the place full. The only thing is the worst that can happen is an owner will lose one, rent one month's rental income and we then focus on ensuring that we get another tenant in but that that's, place. That's only if there's a surplus as well, you know? Yeah, okay, okay. but uh, other than that, there's nothing. Um, you know, maintenance is on board. Uh, the, if, you know, if this something happens in the apartment, um, the ceiling caves in or something, which never happens because we're in the high-rise buildings. Uh, those are the type of things and people are going to worry about. And that's where you come in. Yes, you are there to manage all of those disasters or eventualities. Yeah. In closing then, what are your final words as far as uh, this, this beautiful picture that you've painted and obviously opportunities for our community and other people watching in this watching us this morning that if you have some surplus cash here's an opportunity or perhaps if you're at a dead end as far as your job is concerned and don't know what to do with your life going forward you are offering internships what do you want to say to us in closing well basically um Come and join us. There is an opportunity uh, that's uh, that's here w with us. Uh, it's a booming opportunity. Um, you can actually make something out of this, like something great out of this, as an estate agent uh, with us in our company. Um, so that's uh, that's what I would offer them basically. Nasima, when you started ten years ago, you had a dream. Yeah. You had a, had a vision. Did you truly believe you were going to realize the dream? I because didn't. there were lots of obstacles in yes, your way. Yes, 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 I didn't. But now, yes, I do. Um, believe in yourself and just follow your heart, I suppose. Have Inshallah. a passion in what you do. Inshallah. And if you're mm. passionate about what you do, it's not a job any longer, is oh, it? Oh, yes. Mm. Ours is a... Is a, is a party type of job. <laughs> we have our... Listen, I commend you for believing in yourself and for building this amazing um, company, Nasima uh, Property Investments. Alhamdulillah, I hope and pray, inshallah, that you grow from strength to strength. I mean, Thank you indeed for being with us. Just our phone and, numbers, um, if anybody needs to contact us, I'm going to say the landline number out bright Go for ahead. the two interns, 11 884 um, contact us on our email uh, on our email address admin at nasimaproperty.co.za and you have a website and we have as a well. website Nasima Khan Properties in Santon okay great That's wonderful nice. to have you guys here and I think obviously uh, other women girls boys whoever's watching us are at some sort of a dead end in their lives they just need to have watched this interview to know that there are amazing opportunities all it takes is for you to believe in yourself, follow your heart, follow your dreams, and you could truly be on something as great as what you have built. And of course, I commend you as an Indian Muslim woman to break into a very male-dominated, white male-dominated area like the Saint and CBD. It takes a lot. It takes guts and it takes courage. And I salute you for that. May you grow from strength to strength, inshallah. Thank you for being with us.
The mother and daughter duo, Nisima and Charles Yakan, talking to us about the property market and, um, of course, follow your dreams. As you've heard, Nisima said it was tough, but she followed her heart, she followed her dreams. She put in a lot of hard work and she is now enjoying the fruits of her labor. And for those of you, one or two people out there who haven't yet found your dream job or desperately looking for a job, you know you're a hard worker, you know that you're a good salesperson, please contact Nassim Alshazia. Who knows, there might just be an amazing opportunity for you. Go to their website, you can apply online or you can give them a call. Thank you for wa watching. Uh, we've come to the end of the show. I do hope that you've enjoyed all the lovely women we had on the show this morning. Truly inspirational, truly motivating. Till Wednesday morning at uh, the same time, as always, Take care on the roads. Thank you for your company. Also, um, a big shout out to the production team. They're always working really hard behind the scenes to make the show as glitzy and as glamorous as possible. Till the next time, as always, Khodafez from me, Julie Ali. <laughs>